This video is about how to measure the size and shape of the Earth by measuring the stars. My goal here is to be able to measure, measure the physical size and shape of the Earth using techniques available to amateurs. So no expensive equipment, no difficult travel. The reasoning behind the technique should also minimize assumptions and we should list and verify any of those, any assumptions that we use. Finally, it should be easy to understand and easy to replicate. Now you might ask how hard this could be. Just climb a mountain and look around, right? Well, one problem is that air bends light. Uh, we can see in this time-lapse video from Skunk Bay Weather the way the far shoreline compresses and stretches during the day because of refraction of the light as it passes through the air. That refraction is caused by differences in the temperature at different locations and at different heights above the water. This phenomenon means that it's relatively difficult to get accurate, reliable measurement of angles along the surface. Furthermore, air scatters light. That's the reason why the sky appear, appears blue during the day rather than black. The light from the sun bounces off the air and into your eye. But that, of course, also affects the images of objects on the surface. Uh, for example, a mountain will have its light scattered. The light bouncing off of a mountain will be scattered as well. And as the mountain gets further away, the, the image fades. And at some point, the mountain would not be visible because the light would be scattered before it reaches your eye. So even if the Earth was flat, you wouldn't necessarily be able to see mountains thousands of kilometers away for this reason. And finally, if in fact the curvature of the Earth is positive, then at some point it disappears behind the horizon, again making it difficult to determine the overall size and shape through direct observation. So the method we will use is to measure the positions in the sky of two stars from at least two locations at the same time. We will then compute a relative surface orientation that is necessary so that those observations are consistent with each other. And from that relative orientation, we will then compute the curvature and therefore the radius uh, once we also know the distance between those two locations. So how do we measure the positions of stars in the sky? Uh, we use the coordinate system called ele elevation and azimuth. Elevation is degrees above the horizon, going from 0 to 90, and azimuth is degrees east of north, uh, from the closest point on the horizon. So with these two values, we can identify any position in the sky above a given location. Uh, how to mechanically actually go about measuring that, uh, I think the most straightforward way is with a sextant. A sextant is a handheld device that has a telescope and a mirror that allows some light to pass directly through the mirror and some light is reflected. And using this device, you can sight two objects at the same time and then read the angle from the uh, arm at the bottom. And using this uh, without much training, it's relatively easy to achieve an accuracy of about 0 0.2 degrees, which is what I will assume uh, for the rest of this uh, presentation. Now, one issue, as I mentioned before, is that light bends near the horizon. Uh, so we're going to restrict our observations to stars that are at least 20 degrees above the horizon. Uh, in that case, the refraction will be less than 0 0.05 degrees, uh, and thus within our margin of error. And I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end. Uh, furthermore, I claim that the lines of sight to stars are parallel. That is, for any star, all of the lines of sight to that star, even from different points on the surface of the Earth, are parallel. This is to within a precision of 0 0.2 degrees, that's our measurement accuracy. And 
Uh, I will address this in a later slide as well. Therefore, if you have two people who see the same star at the same time from different locations, they must be looking in the same direction in three-dimensional space. And that is how we will determine relative orientation. Consider traveling from one location to another, I'll call them the start location and the end location, via the shortest path. We want to orient the end surface relative to the surface at the start location. We'll use two stars, call them A and B, measured at each location. First, rotate the end surface so that its observation line to A is parallel to the observation of A at the start location. When we do that, we also rotate the observation of B and the surface normal. Now that A is aligned, rotate the end location around the axis that is the direction to A in order to align B as best we can. If the resulting B observations are now lined up, then that is a solution to the constraints of the star observations and that solution is unique. This diagram illustrates the procedure. Here I have the end location represented as a square. The yellow line is its surface normal, and I've got the observations at the end location for A and B, and I've also shown the observations for the start location in gray. This is before we've altered the orientation of the end square, so its orientation is initially the same as the start square orientation, and therefore the star observations do not align. First thing we have to do is rotate in order to align the two observations of A. Once that's done, we perform a second rotation around the line to A in order to align B. And then when that's done, if all is well, both stars are now aligned and we now have a new surface normal that tells us about the curvature between the two locations. In the simple case, we have what's called positive normal curvature. To calculate that, you simply calculate the angle through which the surface normal was rotated, determine what part of a circle that is, and multiply by the distance to get the circumference of curvature. The radius of curvature is then the circumference divided by 2 pi, and the curvature itself uh, is 1 over the radius. If the angle is 0, that means the surface is flat. There's no normal curvature. It's also possible to have negative normal curvature, which is what happens when, as you travel along the surface, your feet move faster than your head. All right, now I want to demonstrate using the procedure I've just shown to reconstruct an entire Earth surface. So here I have a virtual three-dimensional coordinate system, and I've placed in the middle a square representing a thousand kilometers on each side of the region near California. And I have real-world astronomical observation data for two stars, Duba and Betelgeuse, so this first square acts as my origin. It's simply placed in this location and it won't move. Now I want to create a second square and I'm going to go nine degrees of longitude to the east, which puts us someplace in Utah. This is the Great Salt Lake. And I'm drawn, I've drawn here the, in gray, the observations to the stars as they were in California, and in white, the observations that are seen in Utah. And they do not match because the Utah square has simply been placed with the same orientation as California as if the surface were flat. So I will now use the procedure I just described to align them. First, I do a rotation to align Duba. 
then Beetlejuice isn't right. So I take the Beetlejuice observations, project them into the plane perpendicular to the Duba observations, calculate from them a rotation to perform that will preserve the Duba observations, and perform that rotation. Now both stars are aligned. Duba here is pretty much exact. Betelgeuse is around one arc minute away. These are in degrees, showing the deviation. The reason is because the data I'm working with is only accurate to around 0.2 degrees. But we've now aligned this square. The surface normal has rotated with it. And we can already see that we have positive curvature between San Francisco and Utah going east from San Francisco. So now I will place another square. I will again go nine degrees to the east and follow the same procedure. Calculate a rotation, do it, and then a second rotation. Perform that. And now we've aligned both stars. We've got a new surface normal, and we can see that the curve continues. So now what I'm going to do is place a few squares without showing all of the steps, just have the computer do all of the rotations automatically. And at this point it stops because Betelgeuse is about to drop below 20 degrees below the horizon. As, an, as I explained earlier, I don't want to use any observations that are too close to the horizon because of refraction. So the reconstruction of the surface stops here, just going east. Now let me turn off these star rays. And returning to California, I will now go north. So I'm going to go nine degrees of latitude to the north. That puts us near Seattle. I'll show the observation lines and do the same orientation procedure. Rotate once to align Duba. Rotate again to align Betelgeuse. And there we've got our new surface normal, and the curvature, of course, is apparent. What this program also does, which I didn't point out before, is calculate the radius of curvature that's shown here. So between San Francisco and Seattle, using the data that I have, I've calculated a radius of curvature that you can see, 6,200 or so kilometers. The correct value is 6,371 kilometers. Again, the difference, the reason that's not exactly on is because I'm working with data that's only accurate to 0.2 degrees. So having added the surface for Seattle, I can then go east. And again, it stops when Betelgeuse drops below the horizon. I can go north again, continue to go east. Let me clean up these star rays, and I'll turn off the surface normals as well. So we can now see we've got a decent chunk of the surface constructed, and it's clearly forming a sphere. I can now let the computer go ahead and build everything that it can using that observational data, and this is what we get. The reason it stops down at this edge and at the south is because the stars in question are no longer visible. The reason it stops in the west is because it, it's getting into daytime there. This data was taken at 8 p.m. in California, so once you go west, the sun is up, and I don't want to use data that couldn't be gathered by just looking at the stars during the, the nighttime. So this is what we get for just those two stars. 
Uh, I'm now going to switch it to the theoretical sphere for comparison. So this sphere is simply calculated assuming that the Earth is a sphere with radius 6,371 kilometers. And what we were seeing was, of course, a fraction, a fragment of that. Now this program here has some other capabilities that I'll briefly describe. First, although this program has been using the assumption that stars are infinitely far away, I can turn that off. Now, if I want to get a good reconstruction without that assumption, I need to use more stars. So here I'll turn on eight stars. And now when I show them, you can see there's a lot more stars here. And the algorithm is a little bit different because we're not assuming they're infinitely far away. But by fitting this data, we once again get a nice curved surface. And if I allow the algorithm to run to completion, we get a fragment of a sphere. Now with this algorithm, we get these surfaces that are frayed because as the number of stars that we can see decreases the accuracy of the reconstruction, or the reconstruction becomes under constrained. So it drifts out of the, the theoretical model. But where we've got plenty of stars to align, we get the sphere. This program also has the capability to use a number of hypothetical worlds. I'll just show one. So this hypothetical world is created by taking an azimuthal equidistant projection of the Earth and then bending it so that it has positive curvature on the prime meridian and its anti-meridian and negative curvature on the 90 degree meridians. It also has stars, some of which are very near the Earth's surface, some further away, and some placed at infinity. And then I use the algorithm that does not assume they are infinitely far away. So the green wireframe you see is the theoretical model from which the astronomical observations were generated, along with these star positions. And then the algorithm simply fit every square as best it could with the observation data gathered from that model. And as you can see, it did a good job of reconstructing that surface. Up here, it started to depart from the theory because the number of stars that it can see is getting to be too low. Um, but everywhere else, we've got a good fit. So now I am going to describe the curvature calculation in detail. It takes as input 11 parameters. We have the azimuth and elevation for each of two stars at each of two locations. We have the distance between the two locations along the surface. And then we have the travel headings. Start heading is your travel direction when you leave the start location. And end heading is the travel direction when you arrive at the end location. This slide shows the complete calculations. I'll go through it briefly. First, we set up our coordinate system. This is the standard rotation matrix in three dimensions. We convert azimuth and elevation to unit vectors. This part computes and applies the first rotation. This part computes and applies the second rotation. And this part decomposes the combined rotation into three different kinds of curvature. The output of the procedure is these five numbers. The deviation is the separation between the start and end B vectors after the rotations are complete. This should be smaller than your measurement uncertainty, otherwise it means that the separation angles between the stars is not the same. Normal curvature describes the way the shortest path curves in the plane formed by the surface normal and travel direction. Radius of curvature is then the radius of the osculating circle, which on a sphere will be the radius of that sphere. Geodesic curvature and geodesic torsion are two additional kinds of curvature. Essentially, because 
A surface can be rotated in three degrees of freedom, yaw, pitch, and roll. There's a notion of curvature for each of them. On a sphere, these should both be zero. So this is an example calculation. These are star observations for Duba and Betelgeuse, taken from two particular locations at a particular point in time. You can see on the left all the input parameters, and on the right the output of the calculation. In particular, the radius of curvature is 6,392 kilometers, which is pretty close to the correct value. This calculation can also be performed by the software that I demonstrated earlier. Now I want to return to a claim I made near the beginning that the lines of sight to stars are parallel. So it is an empirical fact that you can verify yourself with a sextant, for example, that for any pairs of stars, A and B, anywhere on Earth, any time, so long as they're above 20 degrees elevation, their separation angle will be the same, to within 0 0.2 degrees. So if I illustrate that uh, here, I have my two locations, and I'm in here I'm assuming that location two is reached by walking from location one toward the visual midpoint of these two stars. And according to my empirical claim, the separation angle B will still be within 0 0.2 degrees of the original separation angle A. And if that is true, then it must be that C and D are both less than 0 0.2 degrees. C and D represent the deviation of the lines of sight from parallel. So by walking toward the visual midpoint of any two stars and observing that their separation angle doesn't change to within the accuracy of your instrument, you can conclude that the lines of sight to those objects are in fact parallel, again, to within the accuracy of your instrument. Now you may ask, well, what about refraction? Refraction does occur above 20 degree elevation, although not very much. However, uh, for the purposes of this technique, the only thing that we need to know is that the lines of sight are parallel once they reach the surface. So in fact, we don't need to assume anything about what's happening refractively in the atmosphere. The only thing we need to know is that the separation angles are always the same. And so long as that is true, the, the lines of sight must be parallel. In conclusion, the size and shape of the Earth can be measured using amateur instruments by simply measuring two stars at two locations. Uh, of course, if you want to prove that the curvature is uniform, that is, that the overall shape is a sphere, you have to repeat this procedure at multiple locations. The reasoning is entirely self-contained. There are no unverified assumptions, and I find that it is in fact approximately a sphere with radius approximately 6,300 kilometers and the software that I used is available at the URL shown. As an appendix, I want to talk about, in practice, how one can go about measuring star positions. It's not completely trivial to measure simultaneously the position of two stars in two locations. So the first step is use a star catalog. There are lots to choose from, including on mobile phones, and this will give you easy access to positions for any location at any time you want. However, this immediately calls into question the goal of not relying on any external assumptions. So we check the catalog for accuracy, either just by eyeballing it, or using a sextant, or using a telescope. So I'll talk about each of these in turn. First, using the star catalog is pretty easy. This is the inthesky.org catalog. First, one chooses your location over here, and then the time over here. So then what I do is scroll so that I can see the star of interest, hover my mouse over that star, and in the corner it shows azimuth and altitude. Altitude, of course, is the same as elevation. I do that for a second star to get the second measurement, then change the location 
set the time again to make sure that it's the same time, and again measure those same two stars. Then you've got the data that you need for the curvature calculation. To confirm the accuracy of the star catalog by direct observation, just go outside and look at the stars, see if they match what the star catalog says. On the left I have a photograph that I took about a month ago showing several stars that are visible in my location, and on the right is the corresponding star catalog image. As you can see, they line up very well. If you want to be more precise, one option is a sextant. This is a sextant that I bought a while ago. A sextant is an extremely simple device, which is great because there's nothing to trust, and it's good at measuring separation angles. So, in principle, to use a sextant, you simply measure the separation angle between a star and the horizon, and then remember the location on the horizon the star was closest to, and measure the separation angle between that and some other point on the horizon whose heading you know. However, in practice, it's not necessarily that easy. The line to your local horizon might not be perfectly level, and you may not have a feature below the star that's easy to recognize. And in fact, there's a tension between measuring elevation and azimuth using a sextant, because for elevation, you really want the horizon to be flat and featureless, but for azimuth, you need features that you can remember so that you can measure the angle between them. That's why I think the best option is to use a telescope with an automated altazimuth mount. A telescope like this can tell you the altitude and elevation of any object that you're pointing at immediately. So if you really want to check whether your star catalog is accurate, I think this is the best way to do it. That's the end of this appendix, and thank you for watching this video.